in sequence is the need for more robust security. And this from the core of the network to the edge, to the mobile devices. Making data secure is therefore paramount and even more urgent than ever. IT and security teams have a tremendous responsibility here to safeguard data and intellectual property. And they rely essentially on cryptography to uphold that responsibility. Therefore, it is necessary to look at security with a broader perspective and take that opportunity to act now to better protect data and communications and this from today. Furthermore, despite the fact that the quantum computer threat clock is ticking, the goal is not to replace everything, but rather to enhance existing infrastructures by adding the necessary tools to make it quantum safe. Interoperability between security vendors will be essential then. And this is in essence what reflects our today agenda. So as you can see, we have very uh, reputed uh, speakers joining today. Uh, we will start with uh, Axel Furry um, speaking about quantum technology uh, as the basis for cybersecurity architecture moving forward. Then after that, uh, Thomas Stengel will introduce you to the current G, especially in the mass market applications. Then we will have a break. After the break, sorry, uh, we will have a look at um, QKD integration with IPsec encryption with, uh, as a guest, Simon Bryden from Fortinet. Uh, then after that, uh, Bruno Gonzalez will introduce you to a practical use case of QKD deployment. And finally, Bruno Utner will uh, speak about uh, the next steps of QKD deployment which will be quantum uh, in space. So just before we start, uh, a few words about how we will handle questions this afternoon. So basically you can ask your question at any time through the Q&A tab, through the application, and then they will be answered at the end of each of the sessions. So please feel free to post your question anytime and we will answer them after each of the speaker. So, time to start. Let me now introduce you uh, our first speaker, Axel Furry, EVP Quantum Safe Security at uh, ID Quantic. Axel's motivation is to drive innovation, which he has done his whole life. After 30 years in IT telecommunication, we are in this year two of the quantum decade. And Axel is here with us in IDQ and on this event to share his satisfaction to see the first shift on the IT architecture materializing, sorting long lasting problems, especially in security. So please listen. Up to you, Axel. Thank you very much, Jill. Thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. And uh, as Jill mentioned, uh, I will share our view on the cybersecurity and what quantum technology can provide as value to this. I hope you can see my slides. <clears throat> as Jill mentioned, we are in month 10 of year two of the quantum decade. So time is progressing. And uh, as Jill also mentioned, I think there will be a time after coronavirus if we can't hear this anymore. But clearly the quantum revolution has started already two years ago. And uh, with the massive shift towards uh, online uh, workflow, uh, the need for cybersecurity has increased dramatically. So also on the security side, we have to shift gear to cope with the new threats we are facing. And I will try my best in the next couple of minutes to share what we can provide from our perspective. First, I think you all know ID Quantic, I hope. But nevertheless, I think Gregoire presented this morning um, at the intro, the company and the history. So we are in the 20 years, which is quite a great achievement in this area. And uh, we are working globally and we are coming from a very university driven knowledge, uh, which we still use, especially in the areas where we go into the new sections. 
So we are the world leader in the quantum randomness, um, which will be shown by Tom after my section, and also in the quantum encryption. So at least uh, we are involved in a lot of projects across the planet outside of China. In terms of uh, our capabilities, uh, we try to make the technology as best as possible operational. As we talk from high tech and very specific technology, uh, also in terms of production and also in terms of services and integration and support, because I think that's uh, very important going forward. So we have two areas. Uh, we have the safe security, which is uh, the main topic of today in this section, but we have also the sensing and uh, there's a link between both areas. This link is in the future. Uh, if we do everything right in the quantum security space over time, we will end up in the quantum internet as the next internet we all rely on. And uh, in the quantum sensing area, we are already start to work in this area with the basis technology to build this quantum internet. So that's for sure some time out. So let's say the next couple of years, it will not materialize, but for sure within the ten, next 10 years in the quantum decade, I'm absolutely convinced we will see the quantum, uh, quantum internet become real, which is in the end, the connection of quantum computers in an entangled state. Let's go to the cybersecurity. And I think you all know the, the threats and we read them every day in the newspaper or in the, see it in the television. And uh, I think the attacks get more and more, uh, uh, more specific and also more advanced. And uh, even with Corona, this has uh, increased a new stage where we think we have to react in a different way as we have done in the past. And uh, QKD and is generally more seen as something which is around confidentiality, but there's also a link to other areas. And I will try to explain this in a second. For me, the most concerning one is deep fake, which is in the end, nothing else. And maybe I'm not on the screen right now in person, maybe it's somebody else who is talking in my name and claims to be myself because that's the next type of attack we will see in video and in voice. So for, therefore authentication also of persons in the virtual world, virtual world will become very important for all of us. In the end, if you look, uh, we have different functions on the crypto side. Uh, the most one <laughs> which has the, or the less visibility is the, the randomness. Uh, everybody sees this as a given. Unfortunately, it's not, especially not if we think in future threats. And randomness is a key topic. We have to, to find a better solution, which we believe we have with the QRNG and with the chip we already uh, uh, distribute in a lot of products and uh, different type of setups. On the authentication side and the signature side, typically, so far, it's more or less mass, sometimes with biometrical data, as we all know, so face ID, fingerprints, and other topics. But in the future, this will be added by a physical function to be precise with a physical unclonable function. So that's something which is new, and we announced a couple of weeks ago together with, in a cooperation with a company called ICTK, and I will mention this in a second as well. The key exchange, I think there are different uh, ways to do this. There are some beliefs uh, which say, okay, the mathematical way is uh, as good as the physical way. In the end, both will exist. And I think both have their right to stay, but both have also a monetary to be considered. So we don't believe that only one of them will suffer, will serve all the needs we have on the customer side. And encryption typically is a mathematical topic. Uh, and so everything has to be mixed. So in the moment, we believe uh, there will be a hybrid solution based on both classical and quantum technology. And that's a very important message we want to send to all of you we, to consider both sides. And it looks like that get, becomes more common sense, even in areas where the mathematical path was the favorite so far. As it is not that easy, uh, to implement only a new software. There's a couple of other things to be considered as well. So that's the journey in front of us. Um, on the classical side, clearly QPC, and then for sure, this will replace algorithms which are already existing. 
And uh, there's a belief, maybe also some knowledge, that this will be resistant to the quantum computer. But uh, to be honest, with my own experience, uh, there were a lot of algorithms which were proven to be secure and has to be renewed after a certain point of time. And that's most likely will happen in this area as well. On the quantum side, uh, we have a clear journey, uh, which we promote since a couple of years, I would say, which starts with the randomness, um, adds QKD on top of the existing encryption architecture with symmetric keys to be quantum safe and goes forward into quantum networks. And in the end, the target picture is the quantum internet, which then connects the different quantum computers um, in an entangled way. Therefore, still some technology is needed, obviously. So what is the answer using quantum technology in the cybersecurity space? So the answer is, in the first step, you combine the Turan Xi, as you can see this on the picture on the right-hand side, and with a PATH technology, so a physical unclonable function. Uh, I will explain a little bit what does it mean. During every wafer production, there is a very specific fingerprint inside of the wafer, which cannot be changed afterwards. If you store this data and verify afterwards during the use of this chip produced on this wafer, you have a unique identifier, uh, at least for the device. If you combine this with QRNG, uh, you have the huge advantage to communication is on a very high secure level. And then if you combine this even with a database, which is highly secure, you reach a stage you have not seen so far. <clears throat> the setup you know from a, from a data a couple of times. And um, in the in the future, you will use this setup to build distributed databases, as you can see here with these puzzles. And addition in each device across multiple databases, which cannot be uh, manipulated or hacked because you can't take over all of them at the same time. At least that's uh, very difficult. And we claim to be better. I think the final solution is for sure still some development needed, but it's much, much better what you know today because all the authentication data is stored across multiple uh, servers in different data centers, which are connected via QKD, so cannot be manipulated during the communication. And uh, you verify this in the moment you send the request, right? And there's no other chance to overcome this. This setup we promoted already also for Bitcoin in, uh, in uh, other events before. And we now see this also as the basis for our authentication. And for sure, that's also a service. Very important to understand um, from, uh, from our point of view on the security side, it's not only the level of security, it's also how long the security lasts. And therefore we have this graph where we see the, let's say the erosion of algorithm during the time and the need to forklift um, in the end to a totally new technology uh, to become safe again. And that's something we can't afford and it's also, in terms of implementation on the IT side, quite difficult. And if the data get uh, uh, tapped in the meantime, you have a massive challenge also with the confidentiality. That's something which we clearly don't want to see. That's the reason we have this flat line, which is called QKD, where we believe there is no erosion over time. And so there's no expired date for the security, which is very important uh, from our point of view. One key point I want to mention is on PQC, which is for sure uh, heavily used in different areas. Um, if one algorithm becomes unsecure after let's say 10 years, the data is still needed to be confidential. I think we lost everything and that's something we can't risk. And that's the reason why we recommend a hybrid approach to use both technologies in all areas. There's no line of sight, either via satellite, as you, can, as you will see later. And uh, as well on the, the mobile phone, for example, uh, where we don't have a line of sight, for sure we will continue to support PQC with QR, QR and G technology to make this as robust as possible. 
So that's the journey we recommend. Um, nothing new beside the fact that um, uh, over time, with the insertion of quantum key distribution and the global reach via satellite, uh, we want to make the keys also become part of the authentication by adding the path functionality uh, in the chip. So that's something which we see as very valuable and will overcome most of the attacks I have listed before, um, as they are mainly based on a lack of authentication or manipulation or faking of authentication. I hope that's interesting for you and if you follow this journey. And then I want to finish up and ask for Q&A. Um, and I think Jill, you can see the Q&A because I can't. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was just uh, precisely checking the, the Q&A. Uh, so just a quick reminder, so you can ask your question through the tab, uh, discussion tab, uh, uh, no, sorry, the Q&A tab on the application, and then uh, we will uh, answer the questions. So I have a couple of them for you. Axel, That's good. just a Thank moment. You. So the first one is, uh, in terms of QKD adoption, uh, the first question is, which segment or region is the most active? So there's clear a high need on the governmental side as they have very sensitive data which have to stay confidential for a long time. So there's the highest, uh, let's say, dynamic in this space, for sure as well in the military space. But other areas are now following. So typically financial industry, but also what we see right re quite recently in this year is automotive industry becomes more interested, which makes natural sense because if you drive a modern car, then you control maybe only 20% uh, of it and the rest is controlled uh, from somebody else in the data center. And if somebody can attack this data center, then for sure that's not a good experience and will be maybe a damage for the brand. One thing what we learned recently is we have also some smooth attacks, right? Uh, especially in critical infrastructure where people try to manipulate step by step to but in an invisible way. And with this uh, approach, uh, then over time take over the infrastructure. So that's that's a quite interesting one. And to secure this, you also need QKD uh, to provide, uh, let's say a very robust uh, configuration without manipulation during the lifetime. So it's quite interesting. So critical infrastructure is also a key area there is the movements in direction of QKD. On the QRNG side, obviously the phone is front running uh, and I think Tom will refer to this. And, um, but in the end, every connected device uh, will go in this direction if possible. And we make it as easy as possible to use QRNG, but Tom will explain this. Oops, now my light goes off. That's maybe a sign that IoT takes over. There's no QRMG inside. Okay. Okay. So next question. There are uh, three more at least. So um, NSA is reluctant to QKD solutions. So what's your point? Yeah, I think maybe there are different interests um, on this side. So we, we are coming from the point that we believe the physical security is secure and we can prove this especially with authentication in combination, it's a very, very strong uh, solution. And yes, there are interests for mathematical solution, whatever is the motivation behind. Um, uh, it, that's okay from their side, but even if they promote PQC, it's not that easy to implement. And that was also uh, stated um, from, from these organizations that uh, it takes much more effort than they thought initially. So a simple, QKD is in most of the cases simpler to implement beside the distance limitations, obviously, but with satellite, we'll overcome them. And especially if we feed our keys into a cloud system, then it gets a totally different story. And that's exactly what we are shooting for. Make it as easy as possible to use for every user and every constellation that most likely will be out of the cloud. Very good question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Axel. Uh, next is what current G or QKD technology is available for cyber physical security today? So 
in the end, so the, the, the puff is really a physical security element, right? Because you go back to the, to the, to the heart of the chip, so the production process of the chip and use this for verification, which chip are in front of you in the communication. Uh, and uh, all the other things around the QR and she is only to be there to secure then the communication towards the verification process and QKD as well, as I have stated before in my, in the, I tried to state in the, in the slides before. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is what about repeaters for full internet encrypted network? That's an interesting one. So I guess you, you uh, there are two repeaters in the moment. If you have uh, distance limitations, you have to introduce a, a, a trusted node. And as the name stated, it has to be trusted, which means it has to be physically secured. Um, read that there, nobody has access because you can uh, so not go get access to the sensitive data and the keys. Um, I think in terms of quantum repeater, there's still some way to go. Uh, unfortunate, if you would have them, then we would have solved the problem. Uh, and then the distance is uh, not an issue anymore, so to say. I hope this answers the question. So maybe link to that, Axel, uh, how do you see we're going to overcome this distance limitation? Uh, so you mentioned a trusted node, but any anything else? Yeah, so in the end, the, the distance limitation, we have to be realistic. I think for sure at the beginning in all network, as you have limited number of nodes with the technology, you have uh, longer distances between the data centers and the different nodes. Over time, we expect that most of the net quantum key distributed networks will be quite close to each other because the need is in a lot of areas. So the average distance will be 40 kilometers and distance will be not a major issue anymore. Until we reach this point, we have to work with satellite technology to overcome it. That's the only way for a long distance, especially if you cross the oceans. Yeah, and we know uh, Bruno uh, Hutner is going to speak a bit about that. Uh, exactly. I think during the last session, uh, this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, some question related to service provider and telcos. So first one is, do you believe that QKD could be a service provided by telco? And is quantum internet uh, becoming soon a reality? Okay, so yeah, I would That's see a question a... actually, yeah. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> the first one about service so, provided through yeah. telco, yeah. Yeah, if I think uh, telcos uh, have to implement this to keep with the demand of the customer side and uh, security demand will go up. So they, if they get asked to have a quantum safe uh, VPN or quantum safe communication, set up, then I would recommend telcos to offer a service uh, based on QKD or something in this area, right? So the second question was about? Do you think the quantum internet is going to be a reality soon? Ooh, yeah, I think in the end, <laughs> the, the quantum internet to some extent is most likely closer than the quantum computing. Uh, as uh, the repeater is less complex than a quantum computer. Mm. Uh, how fast this will materialize is a good question. And for me, it's more a question who will be the, the successor, right? Because we have seen some companies based on the internet business model, which rule the world in the meantime. And this will be the same on the quantum internet. Co companies which see the value and the difference and how to use the difference will be the successor in the quantum internet world. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a huge opportunity for companies uh, from, from, from my perspective. Which, which bring me to the, to the next question. And I think here you can really uh, explain about the use case we have. Uh, so the question is in the 5G, should QKD be a kind of security requirements that service providers should guarantee in the next deployments? I would strongly recommend because I think 5G will be the core network for all infrastructures. And if, uh, you attack the backbone of this and corrupt them to some in some way, then for sure that's not good for the country uh, this network relies to, right? So, and there's a reason why, for example, in Korea, SKT has already secured their backbone with QKD. And uh, that's for sure something somebody else should consider, especially also the core networks or so the control networks of the networks 
should be secured with QKD. That's a clear recommendation from our perspective. Yes. Okay, thank you. And one last, I think. Yes. Um, do you see QKD becoming mainstream? And if so, in what time frame? I think Gregor showed this morning the slide of the internet nodes uh, growth rate, so to say. Uh, as everything goes faster, um, I expect uh, also the QKD expansion uh, will go faster. And for sure, we have our homework to do to make it as easy as possible and for sure also affordable for our customers uh, to use QKD. And one way is clearly uh, development on the hardware side, reduce the cost of the hardware side, but also adapt the offering to a way where we share the infrastructure across uh, multiple customers and make it so affordable for each customer to uh, to use this great technology, right? And, for, and the next step is then clearly also uh, going to the next level into the cloud, which is then a massive scaling uh, and most likely the easiest way to use uh, quantum key distribution. So that would be my answer. So thank you. I don't see any other question at this stage maybe we can still take one more again you can post it let me check no no more questions so thank you very much axel thank uh, you jill and have this, a good uh, meeting and thanks for the question was good questions looking forward yeah. to see you again bye so thank you very much bye bye axel so it's a time for me to uh, introduce our uh, second speaker uh, Thomas Stengel, Senior Director of Business Development globally for the IDQ Currency products. Uh, as you will see, Currency makes existing security more secure from mobile phones, IoT devices, computing, automotive, to core products uh, in data centers and telecommunications. Tom has over 25 years of experience in the semiconductor industry, including artificial intelligence, advanced video processing, networking, and quantum security technologies. Tom leads the IDQ chip product line from implementing quantum cybersecurity today in mobile phones, IoT, cloud, and many other applications. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. And welcome everybody to IDQ's uh, session here. And this is gonna be about the QRNGs and the mass market technology. You know, the quantum decade is, we're already into it. As Axel showed you in the last slide deck, we're already deep into the second year of the quantum decade. And what, what do I mean by that, at least from the QRNG point of view? And the one that, what I mean by that is the technology that can make someone's life better in some way or another. It already exists. It's already available in a useful size and at a useful cost. And with a way to deploy it, that anyone can get get it and use it now. Of course, the great example has been mentioned uh, multiple times today, you know, that QRGs, quantum enhanced security is already in some cell phones. And um, it, it's really the, the ultimate way today to show that anyone, even somebody who understands nothing about technology, but desires more security for their information can get it today. And that there's nothing more poignant than the cell phone when when people have them in their pockets all over the world by the billion. I think the key thing is that security is a desire. People want security. They they're not going to stop using uh, technology to do everything from their banking to uh, medical things to the most private possible things. And so they're counting on us, people who supply technology to provide better security each year. And quantum technology is a big and important part of that story now. It, in fact, starting last year, it already began deploying into useful applications in mass volume last year. And I think that's a, a pretty critical statement to make. You know, what is it? Where do we fit? Uh, you know, encryption is an important part of security. There's many layers of security. Some of the basic security, you know, passwords, of course, authentication. There's many layers of security in the world. Encryption is an important layer of security. And, and encryption is, you know, mathematically achieving something very similar to the lock on your front door of your house. You know, it's a lock and you have a key. You want your family to be able to get in. Maybe you 
share a key with some trusted people in, in your family or one trusted friend, something like that. And you don't want anyone else to be able to get in and gain access to the value in your house. Most importantly, your life, but other things of value in your house. And mathematically, encryption serves pretty much the same role. You have very important information to protect. And sometimes it can even be your life at stake in the case of computer controlled cars, where if somebody were to take it over, it's actually your life at stake, or medical devices, where if someone took it over, your actual life can be at stake. Um, and more often, it's just the value of your privacy or your financial information. And that lock and key is just as important as the lock and key, you know, the physical lock and key. And you don't want the key. The key is the thing here that you don't want somebody to be able to do. You don't want somebody to be able to reproduce your key, not to, to steal your key or reproduce your key. So mathematically speaking, the key is derived at the beginning from a random number. It's the foundation of building a key is to use a random number. And for many decades, people have used random numbers that are mostly random. They're, they're random uh, enough for over the last you know, 40, 50 years of, of mathematical encryption. Uh, and they have been serviceable. So there's nothing wrong with that. But now they're falling by the wayside. And a lot's made about becoming quantum computers. And that's very true. They are really going to be able to rip apart um, some aspects of encryption. Um, but even today, computer, computing processing power is advanced enough that there are some things that are at risk and, and we're not necessarily just in a race against quantum computing, but we're in a great race against what hackers can do right now today. And which is why people are already deploying quantum random number generators to make the security better. You know, from that foundation of the uh, random number, Used to, yeah, quantum random numbers much better than a the classical derived ones. You know, super random numbers of of the last few decades were useful, but now are very much at risk. Quantum random number generator is significantly better, and so we're improving security today, not just a roadmap to improve it tomorrow. So, in terms of deployment, it's actually very easy to deploy. It doesn't really matter. Your application, whether it's automotive or computing or Internet of Things or cell phones, mobile devices, you know, today, architecturally, they all kind of look the same, which is to say they all start with a basic processor that's doing a lot of things for that product. And your cell phone is running all your apps. Um, you know, in a computer, it's running, well, all your apps today. But, um, you know, in the end, that CPU, at some point in its cycle, it needs to protect some data. And, and so it hands off to the encryption engine in the system and it says, you know, encrypt this. And, it, and it can, that can be a, a, a video stream, that can be an audio stream, that can be a data stream, or it can be a file being stored on, on uh, the local system or a file being transmitted. And the encryption engine, the first thing it, it wants to do, it's gonna make a mathematical lock for that data or that, that data stream. And it's gonna use a random number in order to make the key for that lock. And traditionally, it pulls that random number from some local random number, some classical generated random number that like people have been doing for decades. And, uh, and that works, except for it's becoming more and more susceptible to the advances in computing power. So now how do you use a quantum random number generation? Pretty straightforward. IDQ has a variety of quantum random number generators. These things are very small. They fit right in the design. Typical size, 2.5 millimeters square. Um, and low profile device, low enough profile to fit into cell phones. Uh, very low power consumption. Solders down on the board right next to the other components that are driving the system. And now the same process happens. The CPU is doing its job, it's running applications, or it's running an automotive, it's running the transmission in your car, whatever the function is. And it reaches a point where some data has been generated that needs to be encrypted, or some communication channel is being opened that needs to be encrypted. So the CPU hands off to the encryption engine and says encrypt this. And now the encryption engine does the same thing that it's always done, except for now, instead of reaching for an old fashioned random number generator, random number, it's reaching for a quantum random number. And the quantum technology does the rest. It's a 
It's, it leads to the most trusted key you can make. So now you've generated a lock and key, but now it's a quantum enhanced uh, key. And that quantum enhanced cybersecurity means you're getting the best possible cybersecurity in your system. And it's very easy to implement because nothing in your existing system changes except the random number generator. And that is the easiest thing in the world for an engineer to implement. Very straightforward. So what does it mean in the real world? Well, in the real world, it's already out there. It's already been shipping uh, various model phones. These are some of the popular ones that are already publicly announced. Some of them have been out there for um, more than a year. And some of them are more recent. And I carry one in my pocket uh, and have since, uh, since Q2 of last year. And it, it has that simple implementation that I just showed you on the previous slide. It's, it's a matter of having the quantum number generator being implemented inside the electronics, just like random number generators have been implemented for decades, but now it's a quantum random number. And that is leading to the superior uh, security for those phones. And they're already being used in phones around the world. Here's an example of how on a phone, it can provide some additional security. And this one's banking. Um, a very large percentage of people with smartphones are using those phones to do internet banking from their phone. You know, sometimes it's an application of simple transfer like Venmo, or it can be something as advanced as uh, your regular bank accounts. And there are already two different banks uh, in the world where you can go and open up a quantum enhanced security banking account for your personal banking. And so all of these things that you're doing, whether you're transferring funds, you know, scheduling payments, paying bills, or just checking, you know, that uh, uh, that your paycheck arrived, you know, with your next, when your next paycheck on the day it's due to arrive. All of those things involve communication between your cell phone through the cloud to uh, the bank of servers at your banking institution. And Today, they already involve using encryption and they already involve that encryption using random number generator on your phone. The difference is if you have a, quant a phone that has a quantum random number generator in that phone, such as one of the models I've already shown you, uh, then the application on your phone, the existing application on your phone to do the banking, most likely provided to you by your bank or by the financial institution you're using to transfer funds, that application can now take advantage of the quantum random number generator. So when it's making the lock and key for today's transaction, I'm, I'm gonna transfer some funds to the young man who, mows, who uh, mowed my lawn uh, using a Venmo application. And now that application can take advantage of quantum enhanced security to transfer those funds and less likely to be hacked. And this is just an example of, a, of an everyday application we're implementing it and using quantum enhanced technology today is already out there in mass market devices and available for anybody. So here is another key example because everybody's texting every day. Billions and billions of people are sending many texts every day. And when you send those texts, there is a certain level of security that your existing uh, cell phone and your existing provider are giving you. And uh, this is a matter of using quantum technology to increase the level of security that you can get. In this case, Signal Software is an existing text messaging app, uh, very, very common and popular in some regions of the world. And uh, there are companies who do add-ons for those. And in this case, this is an add-on that's been created to make a uh, quantum secure version of Signal. So you can download Signal text messaging. Many of you might already be using Signal for your messaging. And you can download a, a, a version of it or a patch for it, I'm an, an update for it, an add-on for it, where you are now running using the quantum random number generator to make a quantum enhanced security communication. This app actually implements uh, some of the early post-quantum cryptography algorithms as well. Uh, and in the highest level of security, there's three layers of security in this uh, app that you can uh, add on that you can run with Signal. The highest level of security is it runs both the post-quantum 
uh, cryptography algorithms and uses the QRNG uh, for that. And that, that's a key thing that I want to state. When people talk about the future of cryptography, they tend to talk about what am I going to implement today and then what am I going to replace it with in the future? But the fact is, all of those planned future technologies today that are on the roadmap, they all continue to use keys. They all continue to need uh, quantum random numbers in order to have the highest level of security. So if you implement today a QRNG in whatever your product line is, such as this phone in front of you, even when a future update, perhaps a software update, adds in different or new versions of post-quantum cryptography, you're still going to need that QRNG. It's not, it's not a wasted effort today. You don't want to use an old-fashioned random number generator when you begin to implement these next-generation post-quantum cryptographic algorithms in other uh, future cryptography. So this is just a quick uh, series of examples. And when we talk about the phone and specifically, you know, a QRG, it's number one thing is it makes phone security more secure today. It's, it's not something you implement with the intention of protecting against something that happens in three or four or five years. It is something that works with the algorithms that are already in a cell phone today. The existing cell phone algorithms already use old fashioned random numbers and as part of their lock and key that they call encryption. And with a simple addition of the QRNG, those same existing algorithms, the same existing applications that you are using today on a cell phone can be upgraded to quantum enhanced security. And that quantum technology is not driving differentiation in higher, higher margin markets today already. The next thing to consider is that uh, everything is wired. I use the cell phone first because it is the most common and quick example, and it's already deployed in, in millions uh, out there in the world. Um, but really, everything is getting a processor not too dissimilar from the processor that's in your cell phone. You know, in this picture here, the door, the lock on the door, like my lock for the last few years has been entirely electronic. I'm sure I can punch a keypad to get in, but I can open it from my cell phone open and close the lock on my door, which makes it hackable. I love, I love the fact that I haven't carried a key to get it out of my house for years. I like the fact that it is electronic and that I can even set up um, for a day or a week when I have a guest, a specific password for them to get in and out of the house. I have a, a guest staying, staying over. Um, and I like the fact that you know the people who implemented the lock I have, the electronic lock I have on my door can be, they're, they're working on, always making the security better. Then it also includes other things. You can control the heat in your house. Um, the picture, this picture shows a particular type of one, but you control the heat or air conditioning in your house. You can control the next generation refrigerators and ovens. They not only have processors in them, but they have Wi-Fi coming in the new generation of household appliances to do the updates you want. There's a lot of functions that people want, just like your cell phone continues to add applications that people enjoy and improve your life. Same thing with your refrigerator, your stove. You know, the, the stove in particular, I already have a wireless application on my stove that monitors the temperature of meat as it's cooking. So it's, you are less likely to make a mistake, undercook or overcook the meat. It tells you exactly what the temperature is inside the meat while it's still in the oven. And, and so when you're cooking uh, a dinner, it's less likely to be broken. Those are features and functions people want but they are hackable. If somebody hacks your stove and turns on your stove when you don't know it, that's not a good thing. Um, I haven't actually seen a case for hacking the broom as is in this picture yet, but uh, then again, Quidditch is right around the corner. Any of these things need to be protected. There are already some of these examples that exist there in high volume, and there are some where the designs are already begun to implement quantum enhanced security for these designs. I'm gonna to touch on a few more that I think are critical. Uh, video surveillance, we take it for granted. I've actually been a market that I have been involved with for 20 years. And uh, a long time ago, video surveillance was closed caption TV. And what closed caption meant was it was entirely wired within your building. Nobody could hack it or see it because the wire connected the camera to a monitor in your building. 
And other than the security guard looking at that monitor, nobody could see it. Of course, over the years, at first we started recording those cl closed caption TVs. And then eventually we added an ethernet port to the recordings and it opened itself up to hackers being able to go in and gain that video surveillance. You know, it sounds like something that's not critical, but really today, many people in the world, including myself, have cameras outside of their house as part of home uh, security. And you don't want somebody else to be able to see it. You don't want somebody else to use your cameras to see when you're taking your car in and out of your home so they know when you're home and when you're not home. So my from my phone, I can now watch the cameras that are on the outside of my house. And that's a wonderful, great thing. Of course, also the one on my door. So when the security guy, for me, when the delivery guy is delivering a package or when a visitor comes to visit me, perhaps I'm not home, I can see them come up to the front door, talk to them briefly, open the door on my lock so they can enter the house while I'm rushing home. <laughs> These are all good things. These are all good services. These are all things that make our life better. They're all hackable. And, and so these are things that there are already companies who have implemented security, and there are some of those companies who already have already begun to upgrade to quantum enhanced security. In the case of the video surveillance, uh, using the lock and key of encryption is something that was only implemented by most companies within the last few years in video surveillance, keeping in mind that when it was CCCV, by definition, you didn't need that back then. And, um, more recently, there's even some countries or some jurisdictions that have begun passing laws to not only require that video surveillance is encrypted, but that it, it actually can continuously creates and uses new keys. Uh, that you can't just make one key per camera, but the, each camera must be on the highest level security, which includes uh, frequently changing out the lock and key combination as you go forward. Uh, medical technologies, you know, the medical devices have been wired for a long time. If you have visited someone in a hospital or unfortunately been in the hospital on your own, uh, there's it's been quite a, a long time now that carts roll around. A doctor might roll a cart into the room of somebody who is being examined medically, and that will connect wirelessly through Wi-Fi to the central database in the hospital, and they pull up all of your information, whatever it is, or the information of the patient, whatever that is. And that's all hackable. It's actually wonderful. It's great, those carts. You can have a cart that's good for EKG or for hearts. You can have another cart that's good for with uh, features and functions that are x-rays or a different cart for um, with having the best possible things for, say, wounds or breathing. And so it's a very efficient thing for hospitals and medical facilities to do, but it's also all hackable. And certainly, during these COVID times, when the with the rise of a Zoom conference like we are on now for medical reviews with doctors, um, that's an important way of maintaining medical health care. It's also all very hackable. And there are already companies implementing higher levels of security, including some uh, early work to implement quantum enhanced security in the medical space. Uh, there, there are some of the more obvious things out there in the world. You know, point of sale of equipment, you know, which, you know, like maintaining our financial communications, that's been secured for a long time, but is in the process of being upgraded to quantum enhanced security. Um, home appliances, I mentioned before, refrigerators, stoves, it's great. I love having that my stove can monitor the temperature of meat while it's cooking, but I don't want a hacker to take over my stove and turn it on when I'm not home, uh, you know, at 500 degrees and, and perhaps cause a fire or some issue. And automobiles, you know, automobiles are great. They have both in-vehicle, many, many functions, each one of which often has their own microprocessor and communication channel, as well as the, the V2X, which is the communication to the outside world, many different ways to communicate the outside world, you know, through cellular bands, through Wi-Fi bands, um, through bands that will become popular in a future that don't exist today, and all of them are, are ways for a hacker to tap into a vehicle. And there's a lot of great things going on in cars. Cars are getting better and better. Some of it's fun, but a lot of it's just really convenient. You know, uh, Axel mentioned earlier about what percentage of the car you don't have control about anymore. But you know, it's a wonderful thing that if a car will break and prevent you from getting into an accident and dying or, or some of the automatic things that, that 
that happen that make our life safer and safer. The automatic braking was the first great one, I think. Actually, the first great one was probably airbags, but the second great one was, was the computer controlled braking that made uh, breaking in emergency situations much safer. But all those things can be hacked as well. And, and that's not a good thing. And, and so improving them with uh, quantum enhanced security is underway. Um, none that deployed in the world that I'm aware of yet, but it, the designs, it takes a long time to get them deployed to the outside world, but the designs are already underway. And of course, quantum enhanced computing, it's really the same story as with your cell phone, which is your laptop computer might run different applications. Although they're converging technology-wise. So the bottom line is that it's existing today. The QRNG not only makes your secure designs more secure, it just brings a, a clear differentiating uh, uh, feature to the market, which is trust. And the best part is it's available today. You can run it today with existing encryption today. And, you know, studies have shown that 92% of companies that implement some new increase in security, you know, increasing an existing secure feature or adding a new security feature, that 92% of companies immediately track some increase, corresponding increase of sales in, term, in terms of uh, either market share or services. And, and I think that's a, a clear thing that we can do the quantum enhanced security now with the QRNG. It's not, not a roadmap to the future protection, it's implementing now to, to protect us. So thank you very much and we're gonna um, open it up now to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for a very comprehensive talk about uh, quantum random number generation. So um, actually you discussed a lot of uh, uh, where QRNG can be implemented. So there is one question about what are the limits on where QRNG can be used for cybersecurity? Is there anywhere where you cannot use it, basically? I think um, from... When you look at using QRG, the point of using QRG, QRGs are to generate the quantum randomness right where you are doing encryption. And so the physical size, we, we are working to continue to shrink it and to reduce power consumption. It's already very useful, it's already in cell phones. There are some micro power applications today where we need a little more improvement before we can get our QRG in there. It would work now, but it would, it would draw a little bit too much power there for some of the micro power applications. And the point is some people say, well, you can, you can ship randomness to that location through some you know, wireless or wi you know, wired mechanism, but that opens it up to hackers. And I think because the most important part is to generate the quantum entropy wherever you are also doing the encryption, um, the only limits I see at the moment are places where the power consumption needs to be less than where we are today, state of the art, which is that 10 to 15 uh, milliamps. Um, there are still some people who want uh, 10, 15 microamps. Uh, there are still some people who want even less power consumption than we have today. It's about the only limit I see at the moment. Very interesting answer because that's exactly what uh, another question we have is how power efficient are those QRNG in the smartphone? Do they reduce the battery life significantly comparing to pseudo RNG used in other phones? So you almost answered the more general, but maybe yeah. just about the phones then. Mm -hmm. Is there any limitation there? No, I, uh, with the phone, the, the amount of power consumption in the phone is so minimal that there is no noticeable or trackable different, difference for the power consumption in the phone. When, when I mentioned before about concern, uh, there are some things with uh, like RFID, where they put RFID on products and ship around the world. And those are things where the power consumption is so incredibly minute. Um, they, they want to protect the information. They don't want a hacker to know what's in that package or whatever. Um, so they want the best encryption, but the power consumption of say an RFID device is so minute. It'll actually work with our device, but that's an issue where today we might affect uh, the power life of, of a product. And so far that's the uh, one of the few applications we run into where Let's say they're challenging us so that our next generation of QRNGs need to be that much, um, you know, that's a big improvement we want to make for the next generation. But in terms of cell phone power consumption, we're a, we're a minuscule addition to what's already being done by existing RNGs. 
Okay, um, actually, uh, let's stay with phones because we have another interesting uh, question which you probably won't be able to answer in full, but at least let me ask it to you. Uh, do you have visibility to when the other major phone providers such as Apple and Google will implement QRNG security features? <laughs> well, I can't say that I have visibility to all of them. Um, I do have visibility to some of them. I um, uh, Let's say that uh, press releases, I really can't say anything in terms of press release. Everything you've seen today in my presentation is publicly announced. And, um, but I will say that uh, it's no secret that the ones you've seen that are publicly announced are not the only ones being worked on and that there will be more uh, soon. I see. Uh, another one which is interesting is about the use of this technology for bad means. Will crime, crime rate or terrorism increase with this technology? Can the bad guy use it for uh, bad things? I want to mean that will this technology be used only for good means? Huh. <laughs> um, so basically today, uh, random numbers are, are, are already everywhere. Random numbers are already in encryption everywhere in the world at every level. Uh, using quantum random numbers makes that security more secure. And, uh, but like any technology that's ever been invented from, from electricity itself to uh, nuclear to gunpowder, um, every technology can be used for bad as well. I don't know that there's some magical way for quantum technology to be only used for good means. I personally am not aware of uh, any bad uses, but um, you know, every, every, every good, great, or wonderful technology ever invented, somebody found some way to pervert it and use it for bad. And so I, I won't make uh, any claim that it's not possible that somebody would pervert it and use it for bad. Okay, uh, let me take one last question because we're really reading, uh, nearing the end of our session. And one is when will QRNG or QKD well, that's not for you. Be able to leverage 6G on industry 4.0 application. So a little bit in the future now. You you discussed a lot about the so present. I will say, now we yeah, I don't, I'll leave it to, uh, there's a couple presentations later today from IDQ that will talk about QKD. So I'm going to leave that part. But for the QRNG, um, I uh, won't be able to talk about any details, but we're already working with more than one company on uh on i4.0 with the QRNG. So like the mobile phone, uh, the question before on when will there be more than the ones that are publicly announced, I will say that look to the press releases from IDQ and from our partners, uh, but the answer to i4.0 with QRNG is soon. Okay, so uh, let's go to one last about the interaction between uh, QRNG and PQC. Uh, post-quantum crypto, um, is there a technology today that can be developed to be ready for post-quantum crypto? Or, uh, do you need the QRNG for post-quantum crypto, more or less? Well, so post-quantum crypto still uses random numbers. And so anybody using post-quantum crypto has a choice. They can use the old-fashioned random number generators with their post-quantum crypto, or they can use a quantum random number generator with their post-quantum crypto. Um, you know, obviously, to me, I sell QRNG, so I think the answer is obvious. Uh, but I don't know any reason why you would use PQC, post-quantum crypto, but go backwards uh, in time with your random number generation requirements. Okay. I think thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I think now uh, we give everybody 15 minutes break and we'll come back at uh, 3.15 uh, Swiss time. Okay. Uh, so let's move now to the part two of our quantum safe security session. As mentioned during the intro, uh, collaboration between security vendors will be essential to avoid uh, a major forklift upgrade of the existing infrastructure. IDQ works with different vendors and network encryption solutions, which may be upgraded with QKD to become quantum safe. And Fortinet is playing a key role as part of this collaboration initiative. Overlaying IDQ QKD on your existing infrastructure is simpler than you may think and can protect investment you have made so far. 
So it's a time for me to introduce our third speaker, Simon Bryden, Manager Consulting System Engineer at Fortinet. Simon has more than 30 years experience in the data networking industry and currently works in the consulting system engineering team at Fortinet, where he looks after quantum safe networking. His presentation um, will be about how Fortinet is integrated its FortiGate next generation firewall with QKD technology from ID Quantic. A quick reminder, you can ask questions at any time uh, through the QA tab. Thank you. So the stage is yours, Simon. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jill. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. So um, yeah, as Gilles said, um, I am Simon Bryden from Fortinet. Um, and really the idea of this part of the presentation is to talk a little bit about how we can take some of the ideas that we've seen over the last uh, the, the presentations uh, earlier and uh, see how Fortinet is putting them into practice. So a little bit of a background, Fortinet is a uh, network security company um, we don't have any quantum products ourselves right now. Uh, quantum uh, encryption, quantum security in general is kind of a niche area for us, um, but clearly it's something that we are interested in. I mean, if you look over the years, we have sold uh, more than, I think it's 7 million products. Um, many of those products are doing some kind of encryption. And of course, our customers are uh, very aware of, uh, of some of the issues that we've covered uh, in this event. Um, they want to know uh, how they can protect the, their networks, and of course, uh, we want to help them do that. So, in uh, you know, with that goal in mind, we have a partnership with ID Quantic in order to provide um, quantum security in our products. And so, uh, basically, what we're going to talk about during this presentation is, is how we did that. So, a little bit on the motivation, um, you know, you are all uh, quantum experts. If you weren't this morning, then presumably you are now. Um, so some of this is not gonna be news to you, but, um, but really the, the, the key thing from our point of view is that uh, you know, we have a lot of customers with encrypted uh, networks, with VPNs, um, with, uh, with encrypted uh, links between data centers, between uh, well, all sorts of things. And um, all of those, I mean, really all of those networks um, rely on uh, technologies which are going to become uh, problematic once uh, quantum computers uh, reach uh, maturity. So, um, you know, quantum computers will be able to break uh, some of the key uh, underlying uh, mathematics, uh, such as the prime factorization problem. So this is uh, something which is part of protocols like Diffie-Hellman. And Diffie-Hellman, if you don't know it, is, is a protocol used today to exchange keys. Now, if you're building uh, encryption links and VPNs that use Diffie-Hellman protocol to exchange those keys, then you are gonna be at risk in the future. And, and again, the, the key thing to bear in mind is that these quantum computers are not available today. Uh, when they will be available, um, I'm probably not the person to ask, but generally uh, I think five to 10 years is, is, is a reasonable estimate of when we will start to have quantum computers that can uh, you know, start to challenge these uh, protocols. So really the key thing today is if you have data now in your network, which could be stored and decrypted in 10 years time, then you need to be thinking about these problems today. So those are the, the, you know, those are the thought processes that are going through our customers. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's why we need to provide uh, solutions uh, to respond to those kind of questions. So uh, what are those solutions? Again, some of these have been covered today. Um, Axel spoke a little bit earlier about post-quantum cryptography. Um, clearly that's a potential solution. Um, from our point of view, there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, the first one being, uh, as was mentioned earlier, that uh, it's difficult to say at this early stage how uh, secure those, uh, crypto, those mechanisms are going to be. Uh, we know that um, non uh, so pre-quantum cryptography um, a lot of algorithms in the past have been shown up uh, you know after the fact to have been not so secure as we thought so uh, i think we need to kind of let this um, 
uh, attain some level of maturity and uh, you know see where people are going to go in terms of which of these algorithms uh, are going to become popular uh, before we start to think about implementing because of course implementing a new algorithm like that is on the one hand uh, you know it's it's uh, resource intensive in terms of um, uh, you know getting the code uh, hardening the code if necessary implementing it and of course it's only interesting if uh, you know you, you the protocol that you decide to use or the algorithm that you decide to use is also being used by others so so this is definitely something we are tracking but it's not something we're doing today quantum key distribution on the other hand uh, is something which provides a, 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 an instant solution that's available today it's proven uh, technology and um, that's something clearly we're interested in. That's why we have this uh, partnership with ID Quantic. And then the last one, uh, I mentioned it because it's, it's also something we're looking at out of band key delivery. This is kind of the poor cousin of quantum key distribution. That's the way I think of it. It's really uh, not uh, using quantum techniques. It's just simply using separate data paths for key uh, distribution and data transport. Now, the idea behind this is that if someone is recording the data on one of those two links, then it doesn't help them. They need to be recording data on both of those links. So the idea there really is to, is, is to keep those links as separate as possible, different providers, uh, different physical paths to minimize the, uh, the chances that someone is actually recording both and can correlate the, the keys with the data. So um, it's a kind of a quick solution. Uh, it's not very sexy. But um, it is something, it, it, it is a solution that, that people are looking at today. Um, but the, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be concentrating on that middle one there, quantum key distribution. Now, before I continue, a quick word on symmetric algorithms. Um, so, generally speaking, um, encrypted networks use symmetric algorithms to actually encrypt the data. Um, they use asymmetric algorithms and algorithms like Diffie-Hellman, so Diffie-Hellman, RSA, those kind of algorithms. Those kind of algorithms are used generally during the setup of the uh, encrypted tunnel, but they're quite uh, resource intensive algorithms and uh, quite slow, so we don't use them for the encryption of the actual data themselves. Now, symmetric algorithms, uh, one advantage of symmetric algorithms, uh, as it happens, is that they are not particularly uh, susceptible to being broken by quantum computers. So there are some algorithms, uh, Grover's algorithm, the one mentioned here, that does that do give us some or do give uh, do make it easier to do brute force uh, attacks on symmetric algorithms. So with Grover's algorithm, you can do a brute force search in an order root n. Um, search space rather than an order n that you would have with a, with, a, with a traditional computer. Now, what that effectively means is that if you're using a, a key length of n today, uh, you're, in 10 years' time, you're effectively going to have a key length of n divided by 2. Now, um, what's nice about that is it's a very easy fix. If you want to be secure today, just take the key length you're using today and double it. Um, and the only downside really is you need to have equipment that would support that double key length. And uh, of course, generally speaking, there would be a, um, a resource uh, reduction, um, sorry, a performance reduction uh, because of the extra resources required to, to do that extra, uh, the, the, the extra processing of that double up key length. But um, most network security vendors are aware of this uh, and, uh, you know, like ourselves right now, the 256 bit key length, which is essentially what you need today. If you do the math and you figure out you know, what's breakable today, um, 128 key, bit key length today is considered unbreakable. Um, so if you double that up to 256, the, 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 the kind of uh, hardware encryption devices that are in our products today uh, basically do those two in the same time. And you know, I think we see that with most vendors these days. So the symmetric algorithm is really not something we need to worry about if we can double our key lengths. Um, we only really need to worry about those asymmetric algorithms. Okay, so um, in order to provide us then with a solution to this problem, uh, we decided uh, a few years ago now to partner with ID Quantic. Uh, we saw them as really uh, leading uh, this, uh, this kind of work. So we have uh, got together with ID Quantic and we've built an integration 
between our products in order to be able to take our existing solutions and build that quantum safety uh, into them. And that's really what we're going to cover in the rest of this presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through um, what that integration involves uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what do we, how, how do we take uh, uh, the, the keys that are exchanged by the, the QKD solution of ID Quantic, and how do we bring that in to our uh, Fortigate product? So, um, if you if you look at a QKD solution, um, which is essentially the bottom part of the diagram that you see now. This is what ID Quantic is offering today. So it's essentially a couple of devices um, linked together by two channels. One of them we call the quantum channel and the other one is a signaling channel. Now all of the magic, the quantum key distribution um, happens on that quantum channel. Um, hopefully you will have seen uh, some other presentations uh, today talking about how that works. I'm not gonna cover it here. But essentially, what you need to know is that over that channel, the photons are exchanged, the keys um, are uh, generated. Uh, essentially, what's happening is uh, data is being sent from a master uh, QKD to the slave, and they build up over a period of time uh, a sequence of key bits which are identical on either side of that quantum channel. So think of a, a constant process of building up a collection of key bits um, in those two devices. Um, and and th this is something which is happening all the time. Eventually there's a cache which will fill up. Um, and, and, and at that point we will have a full set of key bits. So that's a continuous process. And the signaling channel, by the way, is used by those devices to synchronize uh, that uh, exchange of key bits. That's the quantum safe part. That's the, that's the QKD uh, key distribution part. Now then moving to the top of the screen, um, there we have two encrypted devices, and those are the uh, Fortinet devices. We call them FortiGate. It's the next generation firewall product from Fortinet. And they have an IPsec tunnel between them. So IPsec, if any of you don't, are not familiar with that, it's a uh, IP uh, encryption protocol. It allows uh, a secure tunnel to be built and for uh, you know, any, basically any protocol which runs over IP can be passed over that tunnel. It's been around for decades. Uh, it's a very mature protocol. Um, and you know, Fortinet have been building these, uh, or providing products which can build these tunnels for uh, the 20 years more or less that we've been in existence. So it's a very, very mature protocol. Now, of course, it's a very mature protocol, but it's weakened by the fact that it does use this Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange mechanism, and uh, that makes it uh, susceptible to attacks from quantum computers. So um, essentially what we will do then uh, in order to make that IPsec link quantum safe is we will use the keys exchanged by the QKD uh, in place of the keys exchanged by Diffie-Hellman, which are uh, not safe. And in order to do that, we use these connections between the two pairs of devices. Now, one thing to mention about that connection, um, that connection actually uses a non-quantum safe uh, TLS uh, transport. And so uh, you, could, <laughs> you might kind of imagine that we're just moving the problem. Um, but the goal here is that these pairs of devices will be physically secured. So typically these will be sitting next to each other uh, inside of a rack, inside of a data center somewhere. Um, this is not a, a wide area link that can be uh, a, that can be uh, sniffed by an attacker. That's the idea. So this link here we can assume is secure. And what we're trying to do then is secure this IPsec link. Now, the protocol that's used to exchange keys between the encryptor and the QKD is an Etsy protocol. It's a standardized protocol. It has this uh, name on the top here. If any of you want to look it up, um, that's the protocol that we're going to use to transfer those keys. Um, that protocol is a REST-based protocol. As I said, it's uh, secure with TLS. It's an HTTP uh, REST protocol. It's very, very simple. There are three methods. Um, that are listed there. We'll see in the next slide how they're used. 
And the idea is every time you need a key, you can use one of these REST API commands in order to request the key from the QPD. So I'm gonna show you a little animation just to go through uh, in a little bit more detail how we would build an IPsec tunnel using uh, QPD. So we imagine that the, the Forty gate on the left here wants to build a tunnel towards the Forty gate on the right. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to request a key from its QPD partner. And it uses the uh, get key API uh, request from that Etsy uh, protocol. And the QPID will return a key and it will also return an ID associated with that key. And that ID is used to ensure that this QPID over here, the slave device can return exactly the same key from its sequence of key bits. So once that key is retrieved uh, by the uh, encryptor, the encryptor is now going to signal to its uh, partner, so the, uh, the other end of the link, uh, and it's going to send that key ID. The receiving, uh, what we call the responder encryptor, um, it's now going to send its own Etsy uh, API request to its QKD. Now this one is slightly different. Instead of just asking for a key, it's going to ask for a key corresponding to the ID that it received. And that's going to cause this QKD to return exactly the same key that was sent on this side. Now, the last part of the process then is to take those two keys, uh, which are now, uh, each, each encryptor is now in possession of a key. Those two keys are identical. And we can now take those keys and, and do what's called the key derivation process. Um, and that actually derives from those keys, um, a set of keys, which are then used for the symmetric. Uh, uh, transmission of the data. And once that happens, our IPsec link has become quantum safe. So it's, 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 it's a very simple uh, protocol. It's a very simple mechanism. Um, you've seen that this, this API part is, is very simple indeed. Um, a little bit of work needs to be done over here, of course, because we need to do this signaling here between the two IPsec devices. Now, in IPsec, the signaling protocol, there is already a signaling protocol um, which is used to uh, set up the tunnel. So things like the initial tunnel setup, uh, negotiation of IPsec parameters, things like the, um, the, the algorithm strengths that we want to use, um, things like uh, key um, expiry times if we want to, to do a rekey, um, all of those things are negotiated during uh, the setup and, and, and during the lifetime of the tunnel in the case of rekeying. And all of that is handled by a protocol called Ike, the Internet Key Exchange Protocol. So the Ike protocol is already there doing the signaling, so it makes sense to take these two uh, processes here, um, the transmission of the key ID and the uh, mixing of the QKD keys. We actually will integrate those mechanisms into the existing Ike protocol. And the nice thing about Ike is it's already designed to be extensible, um, so this turns out to be relatively easy to do. So, um, so what do we do then? We, we, we add a couple of things to Ike. The first thing we do is uh, negotiating the fact that we can do QKD in the first place. So each of those uh, encryptors will uh, negotiate its ability to do QKD. So um, if, if, if they can both do QKD, then they will decide to do it. If one of them can't, then uh, you will have the choice through configuration of either refusing to set up the tunnel or to set up the tunnel using a traditional uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, what we also do then is we, um, using a, a, a payload inside of Ike, a, a vendor specific payload, uh, essentially, we transmit that key ID. And then finally, for that key mixing, there's already a part of Ike, which is using the, the, the Diffie-Hellman keys, um, which are the non-quantum safe mechanism and uh, generating the other keys from those Diffie-Hellman keys, what we're doing is we're just changing that algorithm to take the quantum, the QKD keys instead of the Diffie-Hellman keys. And essentially by doing that, we are making this link quantum safe. Now, there is no possibility that an attacker can sniff those Diffie-Hellman exchanges and extract the keys and then reverse engineer the rest of the, uh, of the encryption. That is no longer possible. Now, one note on this Ike integration, there is no published standard for that today. Unlike the Etsy uh, algorithm, 
between the, uh, the, the, the encryptor and QKD. There is no published standard for doing the Ike mixing. So right now we're using a proprietary mechanism, I think like, like other vendors like us. Um, and of course, as a dominant standard emerges, uh, we will migrate towards that. Um, right now though, that means that uh, uh, any quantum safe links will be Fortinet to Fortinet today. Okay, um, a couple of things to finish. Um, in terms of, if you look at sizing a link, you know, when you look at any kind of networking, you, also, you always have to think about sizing. You need to look at the amount of data that you're transferring. Uh, you need to look at, uh, you know, the typical um, performance indicators like uh, bandwidth, like um, uh, number of uh, transactions per second, uh, number of concurrent sessions, those kind of things. These are all parameters that you need to take into account when you're building uh, any kind of network. And when you introduce QKD, they, most of those factors remain the same. You know, if, if you have a link today using IPsec from Fortinet, or you're considering uh, building a new link using uh, IPsec from Fortinet, then there's plenty of documentation to help you size that link. But there is one new factor which comes into play, and that is the key uh, consumption rate. Because now, when we're requesting keys from the QKD, we need to be careful that we don't uh, request keys uh, too fast, because of course there are limits to the uh, to, to the, the rate at which those keys uh, are exchanged and generated in the QKD part of the network. So, um, of course, if you talk to ID Quantic, then they will have uh, numbers uh, in you know. The, the, in, uh, depending on, on the product, depending on the length of that quantum fiber, um, there are numbers uh, available which will tell you what the key generation rate is expected to be. And then as you design your IPsec network, um, if you take, I mean, basically you need a new key every time you build a tunnel and every time you rekey a tunnel. Um, and those rekey rates, uh, this is something which is part of IPsec. So it's something that's fairly well understood. You need to rekey your network uh, in order to limit the amount of uh, data which is available for uh, an attacker to work with. So um, if you take the, the number of tunnels, uh, the rekey time and the size of the keys, that will tell you essentially what your key consumption rate is. And then you can look at the data sheet of your QKD system to see what the, the generation uh, key rate is. And you need to make sure that one doesn't, uh, isn't bigger than the other. So it's a fairly straightforward calculation in the end. And I think to be honest, um, Initially, this is not going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem when QKD becomes very cheap. Um, you know, today we would only see key consumption rates, uh, uh, which would start to be problematic when we have thousands of, of, of tunnels uh, passing over our link. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, right now what we're looking at is relatively small number of tunnels on high, of QKD protected tunnels on high valued links. So I think this is not going to be a big problem uh, initially but it is something to bear in mind. And then finally then, uh, we have to think about what happens in the case where we do have uh, a situation where the encryptor is asking for keys and the QKD doesn't have a key uh, to provide. So, uh, you know, what could cause that? Well, it could be caused by uh, some kind of failure. It could be a failure in the link between the QKD and the encryptor. It could be a failure of the, uh, encrypt, uh, the QKD itself. Um, more importantly, it could be the fact that that link is being um, is being observed by an eavesdropper. I mean, the whole point of QKD, the whole uh, mechanism behind it is the fact that if you try to look at the link, if you try to sniff that link, then you are going to um, you know, cause the link to be perturbed by your observation. And so that's gonna cause errors on the link. That's gonna cause the link to stop generating keys and, and that could potentially lead to starvation. So, um, uh, and then the last thing there, poor sizing, that's not gonna happen because now you know uh, how to size your network. So, um, you know, what do we do when key starvation happens? Well, actually the bottom bullet there is the key uh, to it. Uh, and that is of course that because we're continually generating keys, um, if, the, if our problem is caused by poor sizing, then we're not gonna solve the problem at all. Uh, we, need to, we need to get our network properly sized. Um, otherwise, any of those other twos should be uh, intermittent problems. So probably the best way to solve this problem is to make sure that we have enough keys buffered uh, in our QKD 
that we can continue to use keys from the buffer until we fix the problem. And, um, and you know, the products from uh, ID Quantic uh, do have a big buffer. And so we can actually, uh, you know, we, we can size our network so that we uh, are able to stand uh, relatively long periods of, uh, of, of failure or eavesdropping. Um, if we do finally run out of that buffer, then we have a couple of options. We can continue to use the last key that we got. Um, that could be good for occasional short-lived failures. I mean, normally we will be quite aggressive in our rekeying times, so we can actually uh, extend that key time uh, in the case of failures. We can use a backup static key. Uh, we have mechanisms of uh, storing keys. Uh, that's probably not going to be that useful because it's just kind of making our buffer a little bit bigger. So, uh, you know, if the buffer is not big enough, then adding a few more uh, is probably not going to solve the problem. Um, another solution uh, which has been talked about is uh, using Diffie-Hellman, but really I can't see anyone using that in practice. The whole reason why we're doing this is to avoid Diffie-Hellman, so we're probably not going to use that. And then finally, we can stop data transfer on the link. So you can see that there's there's, there's a lot of different possibilities, um, you know, and really in practice, we need to make sure that none of these ever happen. I think we have we have enough options there to, to keep our links uh, up even in, in those cases. So, um, so that's it really, that's, uh, you know, hopefully given you a little bit of a taste of what it means to take some of these um, uh, mechanisms, which may have, uh, you know, which we talk about in a very theoretical manner often, um, this is uh, a little bit of a, a window on, on how we can actually put those into practice. Um, and we do have these uh, running in a number of uh, places today. Uh, it's, a, it's, uh, relatively, uh, it's a relatively simple integration, uh, really, which is good for us and of course, good for our customers. Um, there's nothing too complicated uh, from our side, all of the complexity, of course, is on the QKD side. So just in summary then, you know, we're taking a very mature protocol. We're taking a very mature implementation of that protocol and we're combining it with uh, the technology from ID Quantic, which we consider to be uh, really the leader in, in this area. Um, we're using a standard mechanism between them. And so really we get the best of all worlds um, and we get this ability to take existing links or uh, new links and, uh, and, and render them uh, quantum safe. So um, that's it for the presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your time in the meantime. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for, uh, for the presentation and for the incredible content that you shared with us. It's really amazing to see what Fortinet is proposing today to help customers uh, to be safe against the quantum computer threats by adding the quantum key distribution layer on top of, uh, of the IPsec uh, protocol. So moving along with the session, uh, let's see if we have any questions. And I believe we have uh, many questions that we received so far. So I will take them one by one. Uh, so the first question that we received is the following. Uh, can, I, can I use the Etsy QKD uh, 014 with any 4 gate device, assuming software version six or seven, or do I need to use any particular uh, 4 gate device? Uh, so the answer to the question is, you can use any Fortinet device, any 40 gate device. So this is a, an integration with our next generation firewall product, so the 40 gate. Um, right now, though, it's only available in a special build. It's not available in a, a GA build, so the uh, version 6 and 7 that you mentioned. So it will be available in the future in a later uh, version 7 build. Um, right now, um, you would need to use a special build. So uh, most of what we are doing today is proof of concept um, with, with our customers. We have, um, we have at least, uh, well, we have a couple of customers who are, have limited um, production uh, implementations, but it's really limited at the moment. I think what we're finding is that most of our customers are uh, testing this for themselves, which is why we, we're not rushing it into a GA release. Um, so, um, so, so in that respect, you know, the code is available in that special build, and then we'll see in the coming months uh, that that will uh, be merged into a GA build. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have another question, which is uh, around the key uh, agreement and uh, revocation. So what is the process for key revocation or agreement of a new key once the tunnel has been established? So, um, so this is essentially part of IPsec and that doesn't change with QKD. Um, so 
when you build an IPsec, uh, when you configure an IPsec tunnel, you provide a uh, key expiry. Well, you actually provide one of two parameters for key uh, lifetime. Uh, one is a time lifetime, and the other one is a, a data lifetime, so number of bytes transferred. And uh, if either one of those uh, reaches its limit, then the key will become uh, considered expired, and so it won't be used anymore. And then generally, before that happens, uh, you have an automatic rekey. So, so let's say you maybe have a, a half hour period. That means that um, for half an hour, or for let's say 25 minutes, that key will be used. And then at the 25 minute time, uh, a new key will be uh, exchanged. And so in the QKD mechanism, this means that a new uh, QKD key will be requested. And then uh, that key will be used from that point onwards. And then as soon as that key is in place, the previous key will be retired. So that's, that, that mechanism is, um, is, is an existing mechanism in IPsec. We don't change that here. So thank you. Uh, I still have another question, which is regards basically the, to the model and the software release. So is there any restrictions uh, on the model or on the software release of FortiGate, which supports the QKD integration? And yeah, so basically it's... this is the same as the question, the first question. Yeah, the first so, question yeah. uh, no restrictions on model, and yes, there is the restriction on the software release. Uh, okay, perfect. That's basically it from uh, the questions. We do still have uh, other questions. So basically what we will do is we will contact you with the answers uh, due to the fact that we don't have a, a, a lot of time. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very, very much, uh, Simon, for the keynote and for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you all for uh, sending us the questions. And as I mentioned before, so we'll get back to you uh, with all the answers. Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. So moving along with the session and with uh, another topic. So the theme of the next presentation is to get some insights on how a practical installation of the QKD is made uh, and deployed to customers. So now it's time to listen to our next presenter, Bruno Gonzalez from Warpcom. So Bruno is the cybersecurity business unit manager at Warpcom Services with more than 10 years of experience in networking and cybersecurity projects, as well as in the operation services, focusing in addressing the daily security business needs for customers across the different market segments. And that's include financial, manufacturing, healthcare, and public sector. Warpcom, on the other hand, is a technology integrator and a trusted partner of, for digital transformation and security in Spain and in Portugal. So Bruno will give a presentation on the practical use case of a QKD deployment. Just a reminder, please make sure to ask your questions. We will get them uh, after the presentation with some answer from Bruno directly. So Bruno, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabian. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today to be part of this event. Uh, hope that you enjoy this, this presentation and uh, make your questions uh, at, uh, at the, the Zoom uh, section. Uh, my name is Bruno Gonçalves. I'm responsible for the cybersecurity uh, business unit at uh, Warpcom. And uh, the first question is, uh, what is Warpcom uh, in, uh, uh, for the, the guys that right now don't know it. Uh, Warpcom in Portugal is, is a 100% uh, uh, Portuguese company, uh, actually. But uh, in the past, uh, they have uh, other names, more uh, worldwide uh, know it, like Alcatel, and uh, after that, Dimension Data, uh, and after that, right now, Warpcom. Warpcom is present in Portugal and Spain. And the truth is, uh, Warpcom, with all this history have uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of projects uh, in uh, uh, network area, communication area, and cybersecurity and uh, system and cloud uh, systems. Uh, at the, the other end, in terms of the geography, uh, we are present here in Portugal. Uh, we have uh, our, our headquarters here in Lisbon, 
we have office in Oporto, for Faro, Madrid, and Poncho. And uh, actually, we have uh, uh, our business, our focus is here in Iberia uh, area. However, we have we we still have some partnerships with uh, Dimension Data that give us the opportunity to uh, provide service around the world. Uh, right now, uh, we we are one of the leading of technology technological integrators here in Portugal, and we have a lot of uh, uh, um, partnerships uh, with different uh, different uh, brands and different uh, providers. And uh, one of the and this is important. This is uh, tell us a little why we are here and why we come to this uh, to this area of the quantum is because uh, our differentiation in terms of as an integrator, uh, we we live in a multi vendor environment, and we still uh, always we we try to identify identify what will be the next needs of our customers. What will be the, the, the requirements, the future requirements? What, uh, uh, what's important for the, our customers in the future, in the near future? And this is why the Quanto, in all the Quanto era, and all the, the, the investment and all the research that are being made by all of you uh, in, in this area, is important to us to put in practice in, in, uh, to, to our customers. And uh, this is part of our uh, dna uh, try to understand the needs and uh, try to prepare our teams to get all the knowledge get all the the, the, the knowledge and technology all, all the tools that will will, will be uh, important for our customers in the future and uh, this is why we start to to focus in this area of quantum so what's the challenge and uh, when we start talking internally about Quanto, uh, one of the, cha the, 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 the challenge was how, how to create awareness for this next te technology. How I can uh, talk with the customers and uh, under they understand me because sometimes some customers uh, tell me, no, this is uh, futuristic or this is uh, not will happen or this is, uh, uh, this is a problem that doesn't exist. And this is kind of conversation is important uh, for, for us to understand how we can uh, make this awareness and how was, was the, the best way to, to make this. Uh, I love uh, mind maps, but uh, <laughs> this is a, a part of the, 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 the same uh, journeys, the same uh, paths that we, can, that we can put it here. And uh, we start with Let's make a, a session presentation. It's a little boring sometimes. It's, a, the, it's in the subject that is is, uh, is not very concrete for now. It's difficult to 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 to, to people to understand it. And uh, how what kind of content so we'll share in this presentation? So it was the idea that uh, I'm still there, but we are not co convinced. Uh, after that, we 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 think in, let's make a movie. We'll make let's make uh, uh, something that more in, interactive, more uh, that could train our 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 customers. That could be an approach, but uh, still uh, we need content. We need, we need something, and this is why after this, let's create a demo. Let's create a lab. Should be real. Let's try to to make this more uh, real possible. And uh, after that, all the questions that uh, regarding this this uh, this subject uh, come uh, just appear like uh, popcorn. So firewalls, fibers, what I need, the computers, building space, so on, so on, so on. Well, uh, and now I will change it <laughs> a little. But uh, this is like, uh, and uh, who doesn't like Legos? The truth is, I, I really like Legos. I like, uh, I love playing Legos with my new fist. Uh, and uh, and the truth is, uh, is important uh, in Legos, and uh, for the, the people that have kids and love uh, Legos too, uh, it's important to to some tips, and I can share some tips when you play Legos. 
in to create better better Legos creations is important some tips in some organization and the first one is focus on colors and you should select all the pieces and 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 put and divide the pieces in different different colors identify what kind of particular characteristics that some some uh, pieces have and try to identify the second one is uh, look for real world and uh, try to identify what what makes sense to 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 copy or to use it as base for your creation and uh, the third one more imagine imaginative uh, way try out course so try to change things try to make something different the fourth one is more uh, interesting in terms of legos ignore the instructions so we can sometimes we can use it if you don't want the, the creation uh, that the, the book uh, tell us we can ignore and uh, we can try to create something else uh, think about details is important when you look for the Legos, it's important to think about details and the, the colors, what fits better, and keep things organized because at the end we don't want we don't want a creation that just fall, fall up because uh, is missing some pieces in the, in the in the middle. So test your your creation, and this is some tips that uh, is uh, we can use in Legos, but here in the, our exercise to to build this demo and build this uh, uh, and uh, respond to this challenge uh, we we can use it in the in the we use it, in the, you, we use it uh, for for this let me tell you focus on colors so <laughs> we we identify different partners for for this uh, to create this demo we identify some some uh, some partners id quantic so of course, is a quantum distribution is is a leader in, in terms of technology quantum dis, quantum key distribution systems. So uh, it's naturally a, a partner for us. Fortinet, we already have a, a partnership, a strong part, a partnership with Fortinet here in Portugal. So and the Fortinet has a Simon <laughs> show already invest a lot in this quantum technology. So make all sense. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, fibers and the quantum. So here in Portugal, we have IP Telecom is uh, the biggest operator with all the uh, fibers spread in the, in Portugal. So come uh, uh, a potential uh, partner here in the Deloitte that have all the, the, the research knowledge about the quantum, quantum, uh, quantum subject and have some uh, some partners uh, uh, which connection with the academy that uh, makes sense to understand a little and can give us some content to to the, the presentation that we made at, uh, we should make to to our customers and uh, well we identify the colors we identify the the partners and uh, after this let's make let's focus on the look to real world and uh, and well, when we look for the real world, uh, actually our customers uh, are uh, almost the, the the old sectors in the in the society because we have customers in energy, we have customers in healthcare, we have customers in government, in military, and army institutions. We have customers in telco, energy. Okay. Uh, what is the use case or the demo that uh, that uh, we can uh, build and we can share with with these customers and with these uh, these people? And the the idea was okay. Well, what what is the the common and the common typical in big companies uh, are they typically have a data center and a backup data center and Wow, we have this use case right, right now identify. What's uh, what what uh, typical they have? They have a data center. They have a backup data center. Typically, they have a connection between these two uh, data centers. And this connection right now have the the problem that Simon already uh, explained here again is is uh, explained again. So it's uh, this connection. If uh, in this connection. Some data is valid and could be uh, still 
uh, is important to protect. So this is kind of use case that our customers will identify. So, okay, we already identified the partners, we already identified what the use case that we want to, to, to create and, uh, and exercise. Tryout curves. So in this case, when we look for the, the maps and when we look for, when, when we talk with the IP telecom to, to create this uh, scenario, uh, they suggest that they, they talk about uh, different uh, uh, space that they, they have and uh, they show us uh, one in particular that, uh, that for us could mean more sense because is there another challenge because why? Because in this path, the, the fiber pass along the, the, the bridge. This is not San Francisco bridge. This is our Portuguese uh, 25.25 Abril. Uh, so it's a bridge in, Port in Portugal, in Lisbon. It's very similar with the, with the San Francisco, but uh, it's ours. <laughs> and in this case, the, the, the fiber goes through the bridge. And this, in this bridge, uh, is, uh, uh, we have cars and trains that pass by, by, this, by, by this bridge. So uh, one of the questions was, is will still working with the, with the bridge and with the training and all the interference that could be making the, the cars and the training could be made in the fiber? Uh, so let's try it. And uh, we explore it. and. Uh, we try to verify and uh, challenge the, the ID Quantic uh, uh, 2. So at the beginning, no, it, it's for, for now, it will work, so let's, let's do it. And uh, here we go. Uh, we already identified the space. We already identify uh, all the requirements. Let's start the, 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 the building our uh, demo. Well, the fourth, the fourth one, ignore the instructions. And sometimes in this case, <laughs> I, I will change it for never. So it's important in this case, uh, be organized. So we'll, the first thing that we made was the training sessions with the Fortinet and the ID Quantic because we already have the knowledge, but uh, we need to, of course, to understand better how we can integrate these systems and how we can uh, uh, set up all the all the, the systems uh, and the first thing was training my team to 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 this new uh, technology make the design identify all the requirements and uh, uh, share with the, our partners all the requirements in terms of the equipment and the fibers and after that uh, we build uh, first we all the, the the equipment in our lab in the, our headquarters and the, the after uh, we push, uh, we put this all, uh, we put all the, the, the equipments in the in the data centers and the, and the cross the fingers to all come up and and work. Uh, just to to give a, a little overview in terms of uh, of uh, uh, architecture. So in this case, we have. Two switches, so one switches in in each uh, data center. The ID Quantic, uh, the Bob and Alice, uh, and the, any uh, at yellow the Quanto channel. Uh, the, this is the the magic in here, <laughs> and uh, we have the the firewalls in the both uh, sides. In this uh, the firewalls, we have a VPN, typical uh, VPN. Uh, with IPsec, and uh, in this case, with integration with the Bob uh, and Alice, uh, sharing the keys or getting the, the, the keys from the QK distribution systems. Uh, for uh, additional, we have a key, a key MES. It, this is a part of the, the, the uh, ID Quantic solution to manage this solution. So to see the, the state of the, the Quantum channel and see. Uh, how these uh, these appliances are are working, and we put here one server and on one laptop to make some tests tests uh, between these these two sites. Well, very simple for for starting. 
but uh, was important in this case uh, start with small steps and after this we can we can uh, explore another another uh, options well think about details and this is i can share with you uh, what what uh, what happens when when i put uh, when we put all the, the equipment at uh, the data centers uh, one of the, the things that came up was the okay the fiber the fiber this is our information for the fiber the fiber that uh, we use for the quantum channel was the, the 40 uh, 20 kilometers and here we see that attenuation average was eight and uh, we are expecting that the attenuation would be between uh, 20 dBs. Uh, so two days before uh, the, 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 the event that we, we are preparing and to show some and to some customers uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, demo, uh, we are looking for an attenuation <laughs> attenuator of 3 dB and looking and found it, <laughs> but uh, all these kind of uh, the, the details and uh, all this kind of the information is important to guarantee that the setup is concluded and and uh, and uh, will work uh, at at the end. And uh, in this case, it was a success because we can uh, we are we uh, build this uh, scenario and uh, put in production and uh, try and make the a lot of uh, uh, tests and uh, at least uh, keep, keep things organized and we test it, test it, test it. And the truth is uh, we have here in, in this case, the 40 gate, as Simon shared with you, is a typical 14-8, three under and, and one uh, with the specific, uh, um, specific software, but the, the uh, VPN, was uh, was up stable uh, we monitoring with the kpms all the channel in the here he was surprised by the, the quantity of information that we can monitor and it's possible to to monitor this information by ecnmp and in this case it would be uh, interesting to uh, add and correlate this data with other monitoring tools for other systems, that uh, was a, one part of the surprises, uh, and is it possible to to see the key rate along the time? In some cases, we can try to correlate uh, some uh, uh, change with the train when the train pass uh, in the bridge, uh, but uh, was very interesting to see that the solution. Uh, just work very well along a lot of days and uh, uh, very stable. Here uh, is possible to see uh, other part of the management where we can uh, share and uh, identify all the paths uh, of the, the, the quantum and all where we can put all the equipment along the, the, the geographical spread along the, the world. Uh, in this case, after this, uh, as I, I, I told before, we prefer uh, we prepared an event where we made some presentations and uh, export this to, to some customers. But uh, uh, before of this, uh, we we prepare a, a movie that I will share with you. The internet has opened doors to a remarkable new world, a new highway to information with free movement of data. But a constant concern has come along for the ride. Security. Cyber attacks on public and private networks are more and more sophisticated and seem to live up to the most recent developments in technology. Organizations have to face the challenge to keep up with this evolution and protect their most valuable asset their information, their data. The quantum safe solutions are the answer to the new data encryption and security paradigm in organizations. The secret? It's in the key. Let's see how it works. In the traditional data encryption system, which is based on mathematical algorithms, 
When an encrypted message is sent between two points, two different keys are created at the receiving end, a public key and a private key. The public key is immediately sent to the transmitter, so that the latter may encode the message and make sure it remains a secret. Once it has been encoded, the message is sent to the receiver, who will then use the private key to decipher it. Is this process 100% safe? No. If the encoded traffic is captured, it will be possible to calculate the key being used and decipher the message using mathematical means or quantum computing. Unlike this system, the quantum safe solutions enable us to make the most of symmetric encryption, the so-called private key system. Both transmitter and receiver use a single key that they share, which can be systematically changed, therefore making encryption a lot safer. This single key ensures that the entire network is secure and may be systematically changed. Now, let's talk about the key's secret. This quantum key is generated and shared not based on a mathematical algorithm, but rather following the principles of quantum physics, QKD, quantum key distribution. This is state-of-the-art technology, where bits are replaced with qubits based on photons, the genesis of this key, which move around their own fiber optic channels. This ensures that the key and its sharing are safe. Following several validation processes on both ends, the key that will encode and decode the message is created. At this point, the information is ready to be sent from the transmitter to the receiver with a guarantee that no third parties will interfere. If they do, the system will detect this interference and generate an alarm blocking any interception attempt and notifying both participants. The quantum safe devices were designed to serve as an additional layer of protection, which will fit perfectly into the existing network infrastructure in organizations. Warpcom and ID Quantic are showing how fast and precise quantum computing is in these devices, which offer great protection, thus introducing the technology that will represent a pattern in the new era of technology. This is not futurism, it's the present and future of cybersecurity. For more information, go to warpcom.com. Hope that you enjoyed the, the movie. Uh, as I told before, well, was part of the, the, the goals of this movie is to, to be self-explained and explain the, the, all the theory and the, all the, the subjects around this. So some conclusions. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, my my feeling was uh, we can we already uh, build uh, a spaceship for the future, and this is why I put this this uh, this image because right now we have all the the, the basement to uh, for the future, and uh, what we feel in in this journey. The, this, the system is already mature and is ready, is, is ready for, for real use cases. So in this case, it was very easy to, to build this, uh, this, uh, this demo. Uh, of course, we need to, to understand that it's a new ten technology, uh, of course, uh, but was not difficult to understand, was not difficult to make the integration. And this uh, gives us to, to the second point. Integration with the Fortigate is simple and reliable because the, just work. <laughs> my 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 uh, what the, the feeling that I, I, I that we had in the my team uh, or give uh, give to us was just work. It's simple. Uh, the, the the debug is simple and works. Uh, so what what makes the, the worst? Uh, what we should make in the in the future? Uh, is to explore more integration and in more use cases. Uh, in this case, and this is important for 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 this, uh, and I can share with you. Uh, this is a historic connection in Portugal because it was the first uh, 20 kilometers was the biggest one connection uh, with the quantum technology and with this kind of complexity. Uh, and the the feeling was. Uh, we can we can be quantum safe, so it's not a futuristic uh, subject. It's not uh, uh, something that we should uh, put 
for, for the future. No, it's, uh, it's, it's something that right now uh, makes make sense to our organizations, put this in the agenda and uh, start to understand how we can be prepared for the future area of the Quanto. Uh, and uh, that's it. I believe that I'm on time or more or less. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, really appreciate it uh, from a presentation perspective, real content. Interesting to see that quantum technology is uh, today uh, technology, easy to use and deploy as you, uh, as you explain it. Uh, and also that customer and company have already made the first uh, step or maybe thinking in making the first step uh, for the adoption of this uh, very innovative uh, technology moving forward. Personally, I learned uh, something on really new on how to build Legos in six steps. <laughs> That's really <laughs> good tips. I will, I will try it this weekend with my kids. But uh, yeah, but uh, to get back to, uh, to the presentation and to get back to the questions, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I will try to be a little bit uh, due to, to the fact that we don't have enough time. So I will select some of them. Uh, the remaining ones, we will get back to, to them by email, that's for sure. Uh, so the first one that I do have here, uh, how is the deployment of the QKD is done with Fortinet equipment? Uh, and the second question related to this, is there any need for a hardware upgrade? No, no, as Simon uh, already shared, it's not needed, the, the, the equipment that we use is uh, the typical firewall, Fortigate, uh, and uh, it's not need, it's just software uh, uh, thing. We need to upgrade the software. In this case, we use a special uh, version and uh, that's it. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, uh, is, there, is the QKD from ID Quantic ready to be packaged as a managed service with the fiber and bandwidth? to your customers? It is uh, 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 more difficult to, uh, I believe that in future, and when I, I talk about the integration in new use cases, uh, this is one of the use cases that makes sense to export, because uh, in this case with IP Telecom, this, this is a provider, fiber provider, it makes sense to explore these kind of solutions uh, uh, to, to put this as a, a service and uh, in the future, I believe that uh, is, a, is a good way to, to, to explore. Okay. And my th the third question that I'm receiving here, so according to you, I mean, Warpcom, what are the typical customer segment who are the most interested uh, in this kind of technology? I believe the, this, yeah, so the IPsec and the quantum key distribution. Uh, 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 the, 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 the different conversations that we already have, uh, the financial uh, organizations are awareness, the, the telco, the telco two, and the energy. And the energy is, is interesting because uh, uh, is a critical uh, infrastructure for our nations. So it's, it's a good use case. Uh, it's in, it makes sense to, for them to be uh, a, a awareness about these subjects because uh, in the future uh, is important and is vital for our lives uh, to this kind of uh, the institutions and uh, this kind of companies like uh, energy uh, be prepared uh, for the, the next attacks <laughs> so but the, 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 the interesting from the major was the was three these three finance and, and the telco and the energy Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, due to the fact that we don't have enough time for the Q&A session uh, for this presentation, we have many questions that's still unanswered. Uh, so basically what we will do is we will answer them uh, as of now, or we will get back to you guys with, with, a, with, a, with an answer by email. Uh, thank you uh, again, Bruno, for the thank keynote. You. Uh, and for answering all the questions that has been raised so far. Uh, thank you all for your questions. It's really uh, interesting question uh, so far. Thank you. So thank you, Bruno.
So now let, let's move forward uh, with the session with another exciting topic uh, with the quantum world, which is basically around the quantum in space. Very interesting uh, terminology. So it's time to listen to our next presenter, Bruno Hartner from ID Quantic. Uh, so as a short intro on Bruno, so Bruno is a physicist with a PhD uh, from uh, Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He's also the director of strategic quantum initiatives and QKD expert at, the, at ID Quantic. He's also the chairman of the Quantum Safe Security Working Group at the Cloud Security Alliance. So warm welcome to Bruno and Bruno, the stage is yours. Thank you, Fabien. So I think it has been a long day for uh, most of us. So um, in the last presentation of the day, uh, I will take a, a step higher and go a little bit into space, but uh, a bit more than that, I will really present you my ideas about the evolution of uh, quantum networks, what I see as a possible uh, future, what, what will happen. So we will start with uh, what's available today and uh, move forward to see what we may have in the future. Uh, obviously, since we're dealing with space, it will be a high level talk. I will not enter into details. You've seen actually a lot of details in the uh, pre two previous presentation. So I will uh, try to do something a little bit differently. We will start with uh, quantum key distribution today. And I think here, I don't need to say too much uh, because you, are, you have all become experts in, uh, in this. Um, I will really focus more to, uh, on QKD networks and today, what we can actually build a QKD networks uh, rather long range with uh, trusted nodes. But these are still limited. And in order to go to really global key distribution worldwide, we will need to uh, go to these moving trusted nodes, which are satellites. And uh, it seems a small step, but it's a little bit more complicated than we might expect. And I will explain that in the presentation. And towards the end, we will go to the ultimate, which is really a global quantum communication network with no trusted node. It means you really want to be able to send qubits from any place to any place without having to trust anybody on the way. And uh, this is not possible today, but as I said, we will try to, uh, to see the future a little bit with a summary at the end. So what about today? Uh, QKD today, what is really uh, the advantage of QKD is long-term confidentiality. So we've seen that a lot, so I don't want to go into details. Let me remind you uh, the assumption. The assumption is Alice and Bob are working in this protected environment, so you believe that nobody can answer there, and they have a public channel over which they can discuss, which is not, uh, which is authenticated. Alice needs to know she talks to Bob, but of course it is public in a sense that Eve knows everything which will, or may know everything which will be in this channel. And if we do that, if we assume that we have this uh, quantum channel on public channel on this protected environment, then QKD ensures a, a provably secure key exchange. So Eve can do anything she wants to the quantum channel and Alison Ball will find out. And the main answer, the main thing which we have with this uh, specific QKD environment is basically the long-term confidentiality. This has been shared with you with, uh, from Axel, but I think it's really important to see the difference between any other kind of computational security on QKD. So if we look at key exchange primitive, the way you can exchange a key from Alice to Bob, if you use mathematics, you always have an expiry date. Today, let's say I want to use Diffie-Hellman to uh, exchange keys. I need to select a set of parameters and uh, I exchange a public key. In public key, what's happening is that inside the public key, well hidden, is the private key which, Alice, which the, the user should keep private. But it's still there in the public key which you have to exchange. So if today I exchange a public key, I know that if with sufficient effort and maybe uh, improve computing time, improve computers, this key might be broken. And that's exactly what's happening with the Diffie-Hellman. Let me show you 
on this curve. So we thought that Diffie-Hellman would remain safe for a long, long time. You see the, the curve goes down but very slowly. But then what's happening is now we have the quantum computer and we know that within maybe 10 years or so, there is a big risk that Diffie-Hellman will be totally broken and that the, my security parameter of this will now go to zero. It means the quantum computer will simply break any kind of ex exchange based on Diffie-Hellman within this uh, 10 years, it could be a little bit different, but that's probably what we have. If now we go to post-quantum crypto, today we are not so sure about the security. It means that probably the, the slope is higher than Diffie-Hellman, but we hope there won't be a threat from the quantum computer, so it will remain the same. But what you see is that in any case, after some years, the system will be damaged. And that's really the big difference with quantum key distribution, which remains flat all over. It means that if today you have an exchange which is safe, any in advance in computing power will not change this fact. It means that QKD should be used for high-valued information, especially if it requires long-term confidentiality. So that's really the soft, soft spot for QKD. Whenever you have Confident, confidential information which you wish, which you need to keep confidential for a long time. But there are some difficulties with QKD and the main one is distance. Today, when we have uh, all our commercial, all commercial QKD systems uh, limited to something between 100 and 150 kilometers. The reason is that the quantum channel which we're using cannot be amplified without losing its quantum properties. So if you put a kind of 100 kilometer uh, circle around Bern, which is, uh, of course, the capital of Switzerland, um, you see that it's not too bad. With 150 kilometers, you can almost reach most of, uh, you can reach almost all of Switzerland, maybe except Davos, which you need to reach once in a while. But otherwise, I think you can cover very well Switzerland. However, if you look at the map of Europe with the same circle, you see that it's much too small which means that you cannot really use QKD for any long distance today with single links. So what you need to do is to move to expand the range by moving to QKD networks. And the way you do that is to use trusted nodes. Let me show you the current mostly used way of uh, using QKD uh, with trusted nodes. Let's say I have Alice and Bob who are far away from one another, so we cannot reach Alice to Bob directly. We use a set of trusted node in between. You see how it is. And Alice exchange keys with trusted node one, trusted node one with trusted node two, and so on and so forth. And in the key hop model, you simply, when Alice wants to send the key, she generates a key. And we know that the best way to generate a key is to use the QRNG, if you follow Tom's talk before that. Before that. So you generate your secret key. You encrypt it with one time pad. It's also known as an XOR. You basically XOR bit by bit your key with the quantum key. Then you send the encrypted key, if you want, over a public channel because it's safe. And when it arrives to the trusted node one, it is decrypted. The key appears encrypted with K12 and so on and so forth. So somehow the key hops from one node to the other in a perfectly secure way so that you can, with that, you can really increase the distance between the safe nodes. Let me already mention that this model seems to be very nice, but there is a big problem is that the key appears at each trusted node in the open. And that's not really something we would like to have because if somebody takes control or even looks into one of the trusted nodes, he will immediately get the key. So we will go back to that in a moment. It's not the only way to do a net quantum networks. You can also make a more complicated architecture with not only a linear uh, link between Alice and Bob, but you can go through many different nodes and you can even choose different paths to go from Alice to Bob and uh, build a full quantum network. Obviously you would have many more uh, users, Alice, Bob, Charlie, and many others. Uh, which would link to the network in order to have keys. So you can like that build this QKD network with these discrete secure nodes. Of course, 
as we discussed before, we still need that all of the users on all the nodes are authenticated, and that's a very strong requirement. And you need some kind of key management system now, because it's not a simple Alice to Bob, but it will really require managing the keys which will be exchanged over this network. So in order to do that, you put so-called uh, hardware security module in the, in the trusted nodes, and of course, you still have the distance limitation. As before, in this model, anybody who can access one of these nodes will see the key hopping from one to the other, and this is a possible problem. So there is another model which is uh, interesting, which is actually one of the uh, possibilities mentioned in the ITU uh, standardization, and I call it an XOR model instead of being a hopping model. And the, the idea is that now the nodes, the trusted nodes, do not have to get the keys themselves. The keys will never enter any of the trusted nodes in between Alice and Bob. And it works like that. Alice will prepare a key, okay, then compute the XOR or one time pad with the first one, the first key exchange between Alice and the trusted node, and then she will send the key in a public channel. And this is a little bit similar to what Simon mentioned uh, just uh, in the previous talk uh, with this out of bound model. But here, the idea is that the key is not in the open in the out of bound model, but it's really a combination of these two keys, which means that it's secure. Uh, completely, even if somebody has access to this out of bound model. And she sent that to Bob. TN1, the trusted node here, I put only one, will just simply re, uh, create these two keys, KA and KB, and compute again the XOR of the two and send it to Bob. So you see now TN1 does not receive any key. It just has to do a very simple processing of its keys and send them to the right person. Of course, if you've got other uh, more complicated structure, it works exactly the same. So the idea with this model is that even if somebody has some kind of access to TN1, he will not be able to get the keys, but uh, in order to get access to the whole key, he will have both to get access to the trusted node and to have dropped on all the channels at the, at the right time. So this adds a level of complexity to heave dropping on the systems and a level of security of the trusted node model. In addition, you can, of course, also encrypt everything you send through this so-called public channel to add even an extra layer of security. So it means that with this kind of model, you still have to trust the trusted nodes, but the trust is less important than it was before. Now, we still have the distance limitation. So if we want to go global, we can use exactly the same model, but instead of having a fixed trusted node, we will now use a moving one, which will be a satellite. So in principle, it's exactly the same. You simply need to exchange keys between the ground and the satellite, and then the satellite will move around. But of course, it's not as simple as that. First thing I wanted to mention is about randomness in uh, satellites. In order to do anything in cryptography more generally, you need randomness. And this again was mentioned by Tom in his presentation. If you want to generate randomness in a satellite, you need to have a QRNG, which is resilient to radiation, temperatures, a very uh, cold, especially temperatures, sometimes very hot actually, if you're in front of the sun. So you need a very uh, kind of specific QRNG, which has been tested for space. And the good news is that we do have this kind of device, which is under preparation at ID Quantic in the framework of an ESA project. So within one year, we expect to have a fully space grade QRNG, which can be used in a satellite for any kind of cryptographic application. So just this was a small aside, and let's go back now to QKD. So as I said, it's exactly the same. The satellite is a trusted node, but now you have a free space link between the satellite and a ground uh, station. And uh, let's start with low Earth orbit, which is really a, an orbit around 600 kilometers above uh, the Earth. Then, because the distance is not too bad, of course, there is little loss in space in the void, but the main loss factor is diffraction of the beam. So there is still loss between the satellite and ground, which is about 30 to 40 dB. 
The good thing about this low Earth orbit is that one single satellite can actually cover the Earth, and I will show you how it's done, but it's only once every day or so. Then you can, of course, use many satellites to increase um, the number of keys you can change. The cost is relatively reasonable today in the tens of millions of dollars, but not more than that. And we can, there is a hope that you can even replace standard satellite with nanosat, very small ones, but let's say that may be complicated because the telescope will be a bit small. But it's not so easy. On the first, the most complicated thing is that the satellite is moving very quickly uh, over the Earth, which means that you can, it stays only about six minutes above a target. So within six minutes, you need to do synchronization key exchange, and then you move on to the next one. That's not very easy to do, and I think it's the main challenge with this kind of uh, set of exchange. And of course, you, I will show you that the revisit is only after one or a few days even, which means that it's, uh, you won't have many, many keys you can exchange. And of course, it depends on the weather. If you look at the orbit, let's say you got a satellite on this, uh, on this uh, picture, on this graph, and you see the satellite moving, you see, this is the orbit of the satellite on this map, and you see it's going up and down, and then after one going around around the Earth, which is in about an hour and 40 minutes, it has displaced. So the next one will do the same, but with a displacement. And you see that slowly you will cover the Earth and within about 24 hours, you will come back to the same place, which means you can really uh, exchange keys most around uh, between many places on Earth within one day, assuming the weather is good enough. This has been actually done by the Chinese colleagues who have actually managed to uh, build a hybrid network with both fixed trusted nodes on the ground and satellite, which will exchange keys for very distant places. This has been already done with low Earth orbit satellite. So it's possible, it can be done. Can it be done in a commercial way? This is what we still have to see. The other possibility, but it's a little bit uh, uh, long, uh, more difficult, is to go to geo geostationary satellite. In this case, the good thing is that the satellite remains fixed above a fixed point on Earth, and it can cover a very wide area. So you can really, from one satellite, access many, many points, and you can choose a target where the weather is best. So basically, the satellite will be used probably much more efficiently than if you have a low Earth orbit, which is constantly moving, and then you cannot really choose the target. If the weather is bad below the satellite, that's it. Um, but geostationary geo satellites, unfortunately, are very, very far from the surface. Instead of about 600 kilometers, we are now at about 36,000 kilometers. So the diffraction placed against us on the loss with this kind of satellite would be much, much higher than with low Earth orbit. And we assume it will be something like 60 dB or probably more, depending on the size of the satellite. It's also very expensive to launch uh, geostationary satellite with respect to the LEO satellite. And of course, in order to get a good uh, worldwide coverage, you need more than one because one satellite only covers a given area, uh, although wide, but uh, not all the Earth. So you will need uh, several of them to cover uh, the whole the all uh, to have a global coverage. Today, nobody knows if it's really feasible to do uh, geostationary quantum satellites. There are some projects trying to do that, but for the moment, let's say we still have uh, a big question mark. In any case, there will still be the problem of every of these satellites is a trusted node. There is no other way for the moment, except by doing something completely different. And I don't have much time, so I will not go through all the details, but basically the idea is really, you can make a quantum a communication network globally without trusted node. And what is missing here is quantum memories. As soon as you have quantum memories, you can build from all the existing blocks we have. And here I list them, you need quantum memories, and this is not available. And then you need entangled state, which you can do, which you know how to do. And you, knew, you need also quantum teleportation, which is a technology which is already available today. I'm not going to discuss 
how we are going to do that because uh, it's a bit late and a bit involved here. And I will just reach to the conclusion that, sorry, let's move on. That if you have this kind of quantum memories on existing technology, you can build a quantum network of uh, which will be able to exchange qubits between any point to any point on Earth. So this, we believe, could be available in something like 10 to 15 years. And each of the nodes will simply be able to manipulate qubits, exchange them. And this way, you can build the whole network with teleportation, for example. There are probably other ways to do it, but that's the main one. The idea at the end of the day is to bring qubits to the end customers. Then, of course, this qubit can be used for many uses, including, of course, QKD. But here, here the great thing would be that you will be able to test that the network uh, doesn't know anything about your key. You can really prove that the key from any point to any point is totally secure, like you have today for single link but you don't have when you use a trusted node. You don't know if the node is trustable or not, basically. Here you will have the proof of this. And then this is a first step towards something a bit bigger, which has been mentioned before, which is the quantum internet. We don't really know how this quantum internet will be used, but we believe there will be a lot of application. QKD, of course, global QKD is one of them, but linking quantum computers and being able to do computation much, much faster will also be probably one of the applications. So I hope you enjoyed this short uh, trip to go from short distance to quantum network, to go to space, and then coming back to this global communication network based on quantum memories. Today, we can do QKD links. We are at the stage where we can do uh, quantum networks with trusted nodes. And this is really what is being built. I showed you in China, but it's already being also uh, thought about in Europe. I also go, we, we also went to the space component, which will allow global uh, coverage. And hopefully within five to 10 years uh, to uh, fully untrusted quantum networks, which is a, a preparation for the full quantum internet. And with that, I think that's the end of my talk, and I'm ready to answer any question if you have some. Thank you very much, Bruno, for this uh, trip and uh, journey uh, somehow in the future. And uh, it's very exciting uh, to see the possible development uh, around QKD and how we can build uh, a quantum internet uh, in the future based on these uh, different technologies that you just covered. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, uh, Bruno. So well, the first one is uh, around maybe a timeline. So when do you expect to have a Q network, Q satellite, and uh, eventually a Q internet? <laughs> It's always hard to predict the future. Um, I think this was already a bit answered by Axel that we believe that actually all the components of the quantum internet are probably easier to get than the full quantum computer. So I think uh, before we get a quantum computer, we could already start doing building a quantum internet if there is uh, the need to do so. So I would say maybe within five to 10 years, we should really be able to start building a quantum internet do we want to do it? That's another question. And if we want, then it will take probably five to 10 years again. So I would say, all to, because it's a global system, I mean, you can start small, but at the end, you really need a global system. So I would say that between 15 to 20 years, we could have a full quantum internet. Now, if you ask me what we will use it for, we probably don't know yet. But again, nobody knew what the internet would be used for when they started with it. And nobody predicted that uh, all Basically, even uh, what we could do today, that talking from one place of the earth to the other uh, would be possible. So I think it will be very interesting to build it and uh, we will probably find good usage for that. And do you think it's going to replace uh, the existing internet or? Not at all. That's really something I think which is, uh, which is important to remember is that 
Even if you have a quantum internet, you need classical communication. I didn't have time to explain too much about teleportation, but if you want to teleport state from one point to the other, you also need a classical communication between these points. So the quantum internet will work with the classical internet and offers some new things, but you cannot replace it at all because the quantum internet with no classical communication simply doesn't work at all. So likewise, do you expect quantum cryptography to replace existing crypto or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not uh, same answer, I think, um, and and that was discussed before. Is that um, cryptography today is really a mixture of uh, of uh, different things. QKD addresses one of the issues, which is key exchange mechanism. In order to do crypto, you add QKD to uh, symmetric encryption. You need very strong authentication, which is not done today with quantum cryptography. Maybe it will be, but probably uh, authentication will remain more or less classical. So you will need all of them. And I think you will have different applications needing different solutions. And being flexible, I think, is the main keyword here. You will, have, you, you will need to use all existing technologies in order to uh, achieve the best solutions. OK, thank you. So we have. Two additional questions. I think one of them probably about quantum memories and the best techniques uh, today uh, to around this um, technology. I think this one we will answer separately because it yeah might, because it's, uh, might it's be very yeah, it's <laughs> quite involved. There yeah. are many different technologies, and I think today it would be uh, very ambitious to say which one is uh, is the best. Yeah. Many people are working on this on uh, on. We just don't know. Exactly like for quantum computers, we don't even know what will be the best qubits. And there are totally different solutions today. And I think it would be a, a bit arrogant to say, oh, I know that this will be the solution. We just don't know today. So maybe the last one, because uh, you mentioned this uh, QNG uh, going to space. So the question is, when available next year, can the IDQ space-ready QNG technology be used with Iridium type devices. Yes, that's exactly why it's so interesting is that uh, random numbers are used for every kind of crypto application. So even if you use totally uh, standard cryptography or maybe post quantum cryptography, uh, you will need random numbers in space. And therefore, if you want to secure communication links between satellite on the ground, I'm not talking about QKD, just standard communication links, you will need random numbers generated in space. And this is really our goal, is to be able to provide QRNGs with, uh, in space grade QRNGs, which can be used by any kind of satellite operator to improve the security of their communication. Exactly as uh, Tom explained, today you can improve the security of your phone communication using the QRNG in the phone. So using QRNG in space will allow you to secure the satellite communication, whatever they are, in a better way. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I think we reached the end. I'm just trying to share my, my last slide, uh, which seems to be a bit um, challenging at this time. Sorry about that. Well, if you master QKD, uh, it's not so hard <laughs> maybe to master sharing, but you never know. Uh, strange. Strange, I cannot share this one. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So, uh, well, I okay. don't have your last slide, so you have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it, it's just a slide saying that we reached the end of the session, which uh, we we do actually. So I'm going ah. to stop sharing. So I have no. It's okay now. I think you have it. Uh, okay. 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 So. Um... Yeah, I, I don't know what's happening. Anyway, so uh, so a, a big thank you to uh, all uh, the presenters. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we reached the end of the of the session. Thank you also for. Uh,